Hello and welcome to Senior Moment. My name is David Refson. I am your host for the show. Senior Moment is about seniors and for seniors. I am very honored and pleased to have my uh, guests today, Andrew Rose and Felicia Mednick, uh, who have been involved in an organization called Mothers Out Front, an environmental group here in the Pioneer Valley, uh, among other things. We're also going to talk about a girl uh, who appeared before the UN, and it's a very, very interesting uh, piece of tape that we're going to include in the show, and we're going to talk about it further. But for now, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So tell me a little bit uh, about your involvement, not only with Mothers Out Front, but your overall involvement in the environmental movement. So, Andrew, if you want to start, that'd be great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I've been an activist in a lot of different areas, um, but it was really um, my son who uh, was doing a lot of activism in climate and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm helping you. And he said, nah. <laughs> so um, it was really my sense of, you know, we created this problem, you know, our generations, generations before us. And so that's how I got involved in Mothers Out Front. Um, how long have you been involved with them? <clears throat> it has been um, five years. Yeah. Now, is that how long the organization has been the organization started in Boston and um, started out here about a year later. So it's about a six-year-old or organization. Okay. And now it's national in about um, eight or ten states. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about what they do. Felicia, how about yourself? Um, I, I've been involved also in various issues around the environment and around justice in the world through, since high school on. Um, and in college I got very involved in the anti-nuclear power both in terms of weapons and in terms as a source of safe source of energy at the time was a big movement um, and it kind of opened my eyes to the power of a collective number of people making change and um, so that was that was really influential to me and just nature has always been such a big source of comfort to me I grew up on the beach and by the beach, and it's an area of the world now which is threatening to be underwater if we don't do something. Right. So, you know, as I was, you know, I have a, a young daughter who's now, you know, young adult, um, is growing up, and I started hearing and realizing a lot of things we're doing to our environment. I'd always been involved um, to find an organization like Mothers Out Front, which just says anybody, male, female, mother, not mother. But I think, especially as a mother, I was called to it. What are you going to do for the future generations? Where is our moral voice in the environment? You don't need to be an expert to have a say, to have an input on what's going on. It just felt like a, a really easy fit for me to start taking action about this issue that I care a lot about. And that's the safety of the planet for our children and grandchildren. So tell me a little bit more about what Mothers Out Front is doing, what they're involved in. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, so Mothers Out Front is a grassroots organization, right. and it um, really takes its strength from the local groups. And uh, our group has done a number of different things. Um, we work very closely with Climate Action Now, which is a regional organization. Um, and we, we work on issues of energy, both um, local and regional uh, fighting pipelines that um, we have had an in influence on um, and uh, promoting renewable energy, clean energy, of, um, and new structures for um, uh, energy, like uh, the community choice um, aggregation, which is a, a way for municipalities to take more control over their own electric use. That was actually, uh, you folks were very involved in the recent election in our town uh, where we changed a f new form of government from town meeting to a town council and you sent out a survey to all of the candidates, among them was me, and asked some really wonderful questions about the environment that you felt you needed to know to decide whether you were going to um, uh, back a candidate or not or just be involved with that whole process. And that was a really... Uh, terrific thing that you did, no question about it. It really brought to the forefront that issue 
that yes, people talked about it, but it really brought it to the forefront, which I thought was really uh, terrific. Yeah, I think we had been involved earlier in like helping, not only us, but helping, I think we initiated at the town, um, count, the town meeting to think about approving a 100% renewable kind of resolution and a zero energy bylaw, which scraped by and got, it <laughs> but did. it got approval it and got in, it needs some adaptation maybe to be workable, but it's in the books now that we are going to be part of the solution about what's going on in, <coughs> in our climate. <coughs> Excuse me. I feel like um, we're not going to get the leadership from national government right now, or maybe even state, although the state is moving a little slower than hopefully we will. But we're making this movement go forward. So as we were moving from town meeting to a, a council, a smaller council, we thought it was really important that this kind of energy continue forward so that voters would be able to see if they care about this issue. And, and for candidates themselves to think about, oh, what will I do about this? You know, well, how do I care about this? How can I let people know that this is an important issue? So I think, I think yeah, I think you really had an impact on that too because mm -hmm. when we had the, um, uh, the debates and stuff, uh, climate change came up as certainly uh, an issue on there. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the environment as a global issue. Obviously, it's not confined to our local population here. The environment is a worldwide issue and potential problem. Can you speak to that a little bit, either one of you? about how you see that as a, a global issue and not just, well, even though all politics are local and we know all that, but it's still a global issue. Can you, can you address that a little bit? Yeah, well, um, the atmosphere has too much uh, carbon dioxide in it and um, it really has to be a global solution. Um, our feeling is that Massachusetts has been a leader nationally on so many issues. We had the first uh, public parks, um, state parks. We had the first, our constitutions based on a you know, gay marriage. We could lead and really make this um, the issue of the you know, next 10 years, which is really the most important 10 years in the next 100 based on the United Nations right. um, report that came out in the fall and saying, you know, the scientists keep being surprised at how much worse it is each time they look. And they, they say, we've got to turn this around in the next 12 years. And I also think we have an advantage in this state because <clears throat> there's so many universities and so many scientists who work together and talk mm -hmm. to each other and with some you know, monetary incentive for more development. We, we, we are actually a hub of where change can happen. So not only are we politically motivated or in a position to lead the rest of the country, we actually have resources to make a difference. And I feel like in Massachusetts, we're kind of lucky. Um, we're like one of the areas that's gonna be least impacted in some ways by the direct effects of climate disasters, especially in Western Massachusetts. We're not a coast, we're not already really hot. But there's no way to separate what happens out in the rest of the world with what's gonna to happen to us. If the economy, you know, they're saying, can really be affected by this, it's gonna be a national issue and a local issue too. If, you know, we have friends in other areas of the country that are hurt, that's gonna affect us too. If, you know, if, crops don't do well because of climate changes. That's going to impact the people near us who are growing them. So it's, it's both global and also very local. And right. we, we have a lot to, at stake here. I wanted to, you brought up a very interesting point and maybe we can talk about it in a minute. Uh, one of the people running for president, I hope I get his name right, he was a governor and he's running on the environment as his major issue. And one of the, when he talked about it, he didn't talk about it just as an environmental issue. He talked about how it affected the economy, people's health, jobs, crops, you name it. Maybe we can get to that in a minute. Um, I know about the Paris Accord that pretty much every country signed on to. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with the, the content, but I didn't know if it was a small step or rather a large step, and it's unfortunate that we pulled out of that when we should be 
clearly part of it and probably taking a lead to some extent. Um, do you think it's had an effect that we're not in it, that the rest of the world is kind of signing on to that? I mean, is it having a good impact that all these countries have signed on? Are they moving in a good direction here? Um, it's, the U.S. leadership is critical right. in international agreements of any kind, and the fact that um, the whole world signed on to limit emissions to two degrees centigrade, uh, limit the rise it, in it, temperature. Yeah, it, yeah. it's um, to. The, the lack of U.S. leadership is absolutely affecting um, the rest of the country's commitments. For a few, it's increased their commitment, but um, the truth is that the Paris Accord was never enough. And right. the countries, um, even the, the ones you know, that most are motivated, um, are not keeping up t uh, to their part of the agreement anyway. So, yeah, we'll have a lot of catch-up work to do after 2020. Right, to say the least. Um, I want to do a talk about, as I was just mentioning, something you kind of hit upon. Uh, I was reading recently where they're expecting that the flooding in our country in the middle part of the state is going to be coming up and going to be a total disaster. Uh, so we're talking about people's health, talking about jobs, we're talking about the economy and how it's affected, and the numbers are staggering. This is not a very small event that's going on. Um, people's health are being affected uh, and are getting sicker as a result of the uh, climate being what it is right now. And if we don't attach ourselves to seeing what this is going on, we're going to be in big trouble. But it's also jobs in the economy. I, can we maybe talk about that a little bit, about the health and, and that hmm. part of it? Because I think it's a really critical issue here. Yeah, I, I, I was hearing, I think I, I listened to um, Senator Markey and Senator McGovern opening the Green New Deal last night right. um, in Northampton. Um, they said over the past two years there's been about $400 billion in property damage due to fires and floods and storms in the United States. So it's a very, very um, big issue. And that's and this is the beginning at wave of what's coming. So um, we're going to have to deal with some of these effects for a while unless we pull back and then it'll st start to ebb. But we need to pull way back from what we're producing because so it's not only the economic damage um, um, with rising temperatures and with you know increasing fossil fuels in different places there's more particulate matter in the air because um, the emissions that happen and in many cities asthma rates are increasing astronomically Springfield has the highest asthma rate of anywhere in the United States right. and um, often the people who are affected most are poor people either because they have not as strong structures or because where they're located is close to where some of these emissions are happening or because they have other health compromises. So there are, um, there's a really big reason to think about all of us together and they, they're like the canary in the coal mine, but to start right. with um, having people from all communities, especially people who are most impacted, think about what the solutions should be and how to start because they're telling us how what's going to happen to all of us if we don't start working with them. It's really crucially important to work together and also have a, a really large group of people caring about this. You know, very, very many people involved that somehow been sometimes cut off of this political solutions and they have to be a crucial part of it. And um, also I was thinking about health, you know, even like around here we have Lyme disease, right? Yes. Well, they're saying because the winters aren't as cold, instead of these ticks having one life cycle throughout the year, they're not going to have two. So, you know, a lot of little things like that we don't even know about are going to increase. We have a chance to take some action and to push our local politicians to do something and our local governments, and from there to have an impact on state. And um, from there nationally, I think... The other thing is that if we start shifting to a greener economy, many jobs are going to open. No question. You know, both in 
retrofitting houses so that they're more efficient, in creating more solar and wind power. It, there met, there's a huge economy out there waiting to be exploited. And what we want to make sure is that that stays kind of small business grassroots, you know, effective, but um, no longer controlled by monopolies. We have a chance now to get in and make a huge difference for many people by training a lot of people to be um, able to do this. So that's part of what the Green New Deal is about. I also think, and we haven't even talked about this, how it's affecting our food source as well. I think that's a really big issue here, uh, that the soil in a lot of places has been contaminated uh, by pesticides and whatever, and even though the uh, soil has been turned over now, they're still there, and it's definitely affecting uh, our food supply, which is in turn affecting our health. And there's certainly, as you probably know, a big movement towards organic food as a result, so people don't want this, even though it's probably still in their food to some extent. The other thing I, I recently read, and this was kind of uh, pretty mind-blowing, is that they figured out that there's probably 400 million tons of garbage in the ocean, plastics and so on, mm -hmm. that are... Uh, floating. <laughs> not only floating, but the animals, the, the fish yeah. in the sea are eating these things, dying, uh, if not the content of what some of these things are that's eventually getting into our food supply again. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, a minor issue with our food supply, and things are dwindling here, to say the least. I think we're depressing your audience, David. <laughs> <laughs> I have good news, though. So well, I was also thinking the environment is a solution. Like right. by keeping more beautiful forests around, which when we walk and we feel really good, all those trees are made of carbon. They are holding carbon from the atmosphere and bringing it right. back into the earth instead of into the sky. And there are ways of farming that pull this carbon into the soil, enriching the soil, making it healthier for us. And we have to use those kinds of farming practices, which will both help farmers, help people get better food, and pull carbon in. So a lot of the solutions are about making the world much healthier, more sure. livable, and without warming, without giving the earth a fever. On that note, I'm going to go to a positive no <laughs> note here. Um, Recently, uh, this is sometime in, in, in March, uh, there was a high school movement to walk out on Fridays about the environment. And this uh, was all started by a girl from Sweden. Um, her name is Greta Thunberg, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that. There is a video that we're going to show shortly, but maybe you could talk about her and what she has done to allow this movement to happen. Because that's a very positive thing, to say the least. Yeah, well, um, Greta is this uh, very, very interesting girl. She started um, at age 14, um, really getting out there on, on climate. Um, she has Asperger's, so as she says, she sees things black and white. And um, clearly, the adults are doing nothing and so she's out there saying, you are doing nothing. She's just, you know, naming it. And um, she's become a phenomenon. Um, if you look her up, you know, just look up Greta Climate on the internet, you'll, you'll see um, multiple interviews and, and places where she's spoken. She's been going, um, leaving school every Friday. Uh, to protest in front of the Swedish parliament. Right. And now, around the world, there are students, college and high school, who are leaving school every Friday. And um, their communities are, are backing them to say this climate is affecting us for the rest of our lives. And you better do something about it right now. Well, it, what's kind of interesting is that uh, it seems like our youth are starting to sort of, I don't want to say take over the movement, but certainly getting more seriously involved and letting us adults know, hey, what the heck are you doing out here? And I think that's really a very uh, positive thing, to say the least. Uh, we are going to show the video of her at the UN, uh, and she spoke for a few minutes there, and it's, it's quite moving, to say the least. So we're going to go to that now. My name is Greta Thunberg. 
I am 15 years old and I'm from Sweden. I speak on behalf of Climate Justice Now. Many people say that Sweden is just a small country and it doesn't matter what we do. But I've learned that you are never too small to make a difference. And if a few children can get headlines all over the world just by not going to school, then imagine what we could all do together if we really wanted to. But to do that, we have to speak clearly, no matter how uncomfortable that may be. You only speak of green, eternal economic growth because you are too scared of being unpopular. You only talk about moving forward with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess, even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. But I don't care about being popular. I care about climate justice and a living planet. Our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people to continue making enormous amounts of money. Our biosphere is being sacrificed so that rich people in countries like mine can live in luxury. It is the sufferings of the many which pay for the luxuries of the few. The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. Until you start focusing on what needs to be done, rather than what is politically possible, there is no hope. We cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. We need to keep the fossil fuels in the ground, and we need to focus on equity. And if solutions within this system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself. We have not come here to beg world leaders to care. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. We have come here to let you know that change is coming, whether you like it or not. The real power belongs to the people. Thank you. Well, that was quite something. <laughs> and I'm glad it's that amazing, isn't it? Yeah. I'm glad we were able to see that. Uh, you had mentioned a little bit earlier about the UN report, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Maybe you could expand a little bit about what the report was about and what it really said. Can you address that a little bit? Well, um, the UN um, scientists from around the world have been reporting um, uh, on a regular basis. I think we've gotten the IPCC report uh, every three years, I'm not sure, and it just gets more and more dire. Um, scientists are conservative by nature, and so they will only say what they're pretty sure they've got strong evidence for. And the evidence just gets stronger and stronger that um, the uh, warming of the earth is um, increasing in, in rate, the effects are more severe, and the real fear is the um, tipping points where you, you get um, an effect like the um, melting of the Arctic uh, tundra and the release of methane from all of that you know, fro formerly frozen uh, carbon 
uh, and um, the, the effect of that could be irreversible. So what we're trying to do is stop the increase in emissions and then we're going to have to seriously reduce the amount of carbon. Uh, there is going to have to be sequestration, which is the capture of, of carbon, not just stopping using fossil fuels, but reducing what we've already done to the atmosphere. I, I would assume that the uh, UN has come out with a, a position paper on climate change, I'm assuming at this point. I have not. The most <laughs> recent one. The most recent one. <laughs> yeah, they, they have um, a regular, every year really, right. um, the uh, conventions and have, that's what the Paris Accord was. It was, it was one of the uh, conventions of participants, COP. Right. 21, 23, 24, you know. So basically yeah. they've said, we have about, to not hit a tipping point, we have about until 2030 to not just s say what we do in the Paris Accord, but pull even lower on our carbon emissions, really reduce them by, I don't know how many gigatons, but um, find ways to either sequester or reduce and, or, and reduce our use in order not to hit a first tipping point. So we have a, a limited frame of time to do something. It's like, you might say, oh, this is bad news, or you might say, wow, this is no longer in the distant future. This is something we can have impact on right now and feel good about ourselves, that we actually stop something from happening. Kind of like we've closed up the ozone hole almost. We, we took action around right. that, or you know, we were able to, you know, in other times of the world, you know, take action. We were able in World War II to like, totally change our economy around victory gardens, changing all factories like, mm -hmm. so that we could have an impact on the world in a good way. And you know, this is another one of those times where we can get energized to say, yeah, I'm going to be part of this. I'm going to help something for my children, for my grandchildren. Everybody can have a voice in this. I'm not very good with remembering facts and figures, you know, but I can say out loud to my friends or to occasionally Politicians, I want you to keep doing something to make this change. I'm going to stand up for this. You're going to hear my voice. So that's the kind of thing that will roll. There was at one point where um, one of our legislators says, you know, like, if I even get six calls, she was local, from constituents, I actually think I have to start doing something. <laughs> so we have a big impact. You, you mentioned a group, and that's the kind of the grandparents here. And uh, being a grandfather myself uh, and having four grandchildren, I want to see them around and not yeah. sick because the environment yeah. has sort of done them in at some point. So I am hopeful, given what you said. And I think the idea that there's, they're talking about 2030, which is obviously very, very soon, is going to wake people up to the idea, whoa, we better get started more than we are uh, doing this because time is really coming and running out, to say the least. So I'm hoping that there are some grandparents and mothers out front, or, mm -hmm. and they are, and they understand this movement in terms of not only their own children, but uh, mm. grandparents as well. And there are grandfathers and grandmothers involved. Right. They were called mothers out front. No, I understand that. <laughs> Uncles and aunts. Yeah, actually, the, the, the grandmothers are, are really important. Um, new grandmas are, are one of the core uh, you know, group in Mothers Out Front because it's just so poignant when you look at that baby and you think, what's the world going to look like when that baby's my age? I hope they make it that long. And, and sometimes grandparents have a little bit more time than working parents. Right. So that's, a, you know, it's yeah. something else that's really wonderful and it's a vol totally volunteer organization I to hear. have that. Uh, sort of at the end here, uh, because we're starting to run out of time, what does the future hold? What do you, I mean, we've talked around it, sort of, but tell me what your, your own feelings are about what you think the future holds here for this movement and for planet Earth here a little bit, if you want to address that for a minute. Well, we have seen, you know, in, in part thanks to the, the children, but large part, they're speaking for the scientists, saying, listen, um, we are seeing a change. Um, 
Bet you anything, you're going to hear a lot about climate during the 2020 elections. Abs absolutely. And it didn't come up once in the debates in 2016. Right. So that's going to be a huge difference. And I, I do see in surveys, people are ready to invest. This, this is the most important investment we can make. And there's technological um, dis, you know, discoveries and, and rollout of new technology that really has to be done very fast. Right. And um, I think people are going to be supporting that. Good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end. <laughs> uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. Yeah. I want to thank Andrea and uh, Felicia thank for being on the show. I thank <clears throat> you. I want to thank you folks for watching, and thanks uh, to Amherst Media for sponsoring this, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.